old uh, faces uh, and uh, to share uh, some of the projects we've been doing on this uh, also together in collaboration with uh, uh, Joachim's group. So uh, it's really been a lot of fun uh, and, and some, some, some things are coming up now that are new and I'll be uh, hopefully spending a little time talking about the, the outlook uh, and less uh, on, on the old, older stuff. So let's see, uh, does it have the range? Nope. Ah, there it is. Okay, so, no, nope, yes, it's low. Okay, so uh, the group does a bunch of things, uh, fabrication of devices. We also have a, uh, an optics and uh, atomic ensemble experiment. Um, in general, we work on uh, uh, quantum optics and electric circuits, which is sort of a motif in this uh, meeting, so uh, it's, it's really great to see uh, sort of a sub-community emerging of more fundamental research along with the uh, sort of applied quantum computing effort which is ongoing. Um, uh, and we've been studying also coupling to atomic systems similar to TLSs, also some hybrid, uh, more explicit hybrid projects. And in general, I'll be talking mostly today about this sort of multi-mode photonics uh, approach which is an extension of the quantum optics uh, scenario. And, and because time always runs out, I, I want to say a special thank you to all the people who, who really do the work. And it's, it's really inspiring to, to have a, a small but very, very dedicated a group of people who really, uh, you know, they spend the extra hours in the lab and, 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 and doing the simulations and really thinking about what's going on to get, to get things uh, understood. And uh, there's also, of course, the broader uh, perspective of, of, of friends and collaborators and funding, which we uh, gratefully acknowledge. Um, so, because time is short, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to just jump in and talk about what is the motivation of this particular line of projects. And it's the story of photonics. In optics, they have a, a, a very long tradition of, of routing uh, both fundamental and applied uh, photonics uh, down to the single photon level and, and turning this uh, very technical capability into both basic and applied research and, and, uh, and the beauty of, uh, of photonics and, and mode shaping and, and in space and time is, is part of what is really lovely in, in, uh, in optics. But for microwaves, um, we have superior uh, uh, on-demand capabilities, much better than the optics but, uh, and we can design our circuits, we have more engineering freedom than they do. Our sources are relatively more stable in terms of the classical uh, phase noise of microwave and, and intensity noise especially is something the, the, uh, the laser people can just look at in awe. Uh, but the, we have a problem which is the problem of scalability. And that has to do with some very basic the, ba the very basic and trivial issue is that the wavelength of microwaves is in free space is about 100,000 times longer than that of light. And when you try to put that on a chip, it just doesn't, not that many modes fit. So you can sort of like wrap things around and you can lump element them, but in the end, uh, if you want to do this sort of uh, photonics, propagation, itinerant, traveling wave stuff, you just don't have that much room on a chip. And uh, unless you want to go really bulky, sort of like the Yale attitude of these huge, in, insane arrays of, uh, well, they're not insane because they work, but, but it, it's really, uh, I, I admire that, that sort of direction of these sort of scalable, uh, very low temperature arrays of cavities. It's, it's very interesting and we'll see how that emerges, but it's extraordinarily difficult. So, we want to talk about uh, high kinetic inductance and microstrips as a combination which can really help uh, uh, achieve some interesting things in this direction. And, and we, we already saw in, in Ion's talk a very nice introduction of the idea of kinetic inductance as, as a useful nonlinearity and actually a linearity uh, starting from it. So I, I'm going to spend a little time on the basic physics of it because it's, it's just fun to look at. And uh, it's something that somehow, for sure, solid state physicists don't always uh, recognize its importance. And I think it's emerging also, especially in 2D materials, um, the concepts of how microwaves couple into these things and kinetic inductance as a, as a critical element of describing them and, and the wave functions of the electrons confined to that extreme make it also interesting. 
So <clears throat> the standard description of kinetic induction has to do with the fact that we usually ignore when we talk about the Hamiltonian and talk about the prefactor of current squared, we talk about the magnetic energy as the dominant uh, representation of that aspect of the Hamiltonian. And, and that's because it's at least 12 orders of magnitude dominating over the uh, kinetic energy of the charge carriers in almost any normal scenario except in plasmonics and in the superconducting amorphous materials I'll be talking about and we already heard about somewhat. So those are two extremes of nature in which kinetic inductance can actually dominate. And it can be even 100 or 1,000 times larger than the magnetic energy. And mathematically, it's, it's very, very simple. We're just talking about here the linear uh, uh, approximation of, of you know, current as, as in some sort of average velocity, drift velocity, uh, multiplying a, a charge density and a mass. And, and you get a, a, an expression where when you lump it all together, which has a kinetic inductance term, which could be contrasted with a magnetic uh, B field uh, inductance. And this can be compactly uh, lumped into uh, being uh, proportional to geometric terms, L the length of the wire, and A, sorry, it's not marked here, but L is the length of this wire, and A is its cross section. And we have here a material property, which is uh, just the uh, London uh, uh, depth of the, of the superconductor. And why does this work in superconductors? Because we've basically swept away the resistance. And in order to make this uh, significant effect, we actually have to work with nanostructures in which L over A, or especially A, is small. So these like nanowires, just like we saw in the previous talk, but also uh, really lousy conductors in terms of uh, amorphous materials with uh, wh where the effective uh, carrier density is very low. And that, by being one over, jumps up, raises up the kinetic inductance. And uh, there's also a, a nonlinearity. So let, let's call this, this kinetic inductance to have some sort of linear, low, low current uh, sort of uh, linear limit. But then there's a, a quadratic uh, correction, which uh, uh, gives us an interesting nonlinearity, interesting and useful nonlinearity. So yeah, if, if someone can move that window away, that would be helpful. Thank you. Great, thanks. So here, for example, is uh, is an experiment you just do on a on a resonator, and you you measure its uh, its you know as a function of power, and you see this sort of duffing duffing like softening, and and even if you go even higher, bifurcation. Uh, of the uh, response of that resonator. And if, if you want to ask where this nonlinearity coming from, um, I won't spend too much time on it. And there's sort of like a Ginsburg-Landau intuition. And actually, if anyone's aware of a, a more in-depth BCS calculation, I'd, I'd be happy to see it. It's, it's kind of hard to track down. There's a, lot, there's a lot of perturbative stuff. But when you go to higher power, uh, approaching the critical currents to, to really track down the nonlinearity and the low temperature limit is, is, is a little fishy. Uh, there's analogies to Josephson junction arrays, which are, of course, relevant. But again, those are a limited validity. Uh, so so I, I'd be curious to see a lumped element calculation. If anyone has it, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know. So please approach me in the break if you, if you know of it. Um, and, and the short version of this explaining this nonlinearity is that high currents, high relative to or on order of the critical currents, suppress the, the gap. You suppress the graph, gap that reduces the, the superfluid uh, charge carrier density. And if you insist on having the same current, that means they have to move faster. The, in order to achieve the same current with a, with a lower uh, carrier density, you have to move faster, i.e. more kinetic energy. Kinetic inductance is, is uh, appropriately uh, uh, boosted uh, by this nonlinearity. So this I naught is going to be on order of the critical current of the uh, actual uh, wire. So uh, in typical regular uh, rectangular wires, it's, it's usually a factor of three of the critical current. Again, being a perturbative term, you can, of course, drive more current than the, than the actual critical current. And, and this gives rise to this sort of nonlinear wave equation where the inductance depends on the current. And that, of course, gives uh, the possibility of wave mixing phenomena, 
So uh, initially we started out by looking at four-wave mixing where you have a strong pump and a signal uh, which is added to it, a weak signal will get amplified by the four-wave mixing phenomena. Of course you need phase matching and all the, the machinery of uh, quantum optics. Uh, again, in a classical nonlinear wave, but we're hoping to reach uh, single photon uh, uh, noise limits. Uh, and, and there's obviously an idler which is being created by these sort of parametric uh, activity with this sort of dispersion. And the popular Im implementations by far are uh, Josephson junction arrays and the so-called tupas. Um, and the significant disadvantage, aside from having a huge advantage of actually working and being relatively low loss, they, <laughs> they have, you know, you have to say something about a disadvantage being scientists and always looking for something new and being critical people. So we have to say what's wrong with them is, and that was mentioned in the previous talk, is the low dynamic range. An order of a few tens of photons uh, going through these things, they start saturating and behaving in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in all kinds of strange and, and also heating up in all in modes and, and it's not a regime you want to go to uh, if you uh, value your qubits. Um, kinetic inductance uh, and nonlinearities have a, a, a sort of an engineering limit of, of being very, very impedance mismatched. And, and it's related to the Josephson junctions, but the Josephson junctions are sort of lumped element and it's kind of easier to deal with them. And the kinetic inductance is more of an intrinsic uh, element and it, it's, it's a bit harder to, to get a 50 ohm transmission line out of this thing. And some attempts were made uh, uh, with coplanar waveguides and, and just to remind you of, uh, especially the theorists in the audience, is that when you have a, any, any sort of transmission line, you, you talk about a typical impedance, which is the square root of the ratio of the inductance per unit length, that's the little L here, and capacitance per unit length. That sort of ratio gives you a typical impedance, and our electronics, for relatively fundamental reasons, is 50 ohms. It's sort of an interesting compromise of uh, the impedance of the vacuum and dielectrics, and uh, it's, an, it's an interesting story. But 50 ohms is the standard electronics. That's what we're coming in with. That's what the hemp amplifiers want to see. And not having that in, a, uh, in these traces is going to be very problematic. And, uh, and, and, and for the uh, uh, um, kinetic inductance amplifiers, this is barely feasible to, to get enough capacitance to make this close to 50 ohms. Actually, it typically fails, and, and what, what you do is you do these... Uh, 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 Klopsenstein uh, tapers in order to transition adiabatically within a certain bandwidth to much higher impedances and that actually significantly extends these amplifiers to be chips of a few centimeters with lots and lots of coils and, and a lot of microwave engineering. There's all uh, interesting uh, fractal capacitance work that was done in various places, also in Chalmers. And, uh, and, and these are, are, are barely feasible. It's just very hard to accumulate the, the proper parameters for this, and you get these uh, highly rippled uh, gain curves because of, uh, because of this. Uh, and and we, we went for something which, uh, in the end, it, it's, it's sort of obvious, but it, it's, it has this elegance to it. Uh, the idea of having this kinetic inductance trace, but a very, very narrow uh, dielectric gap to a ground gives you a huge capacitance per unit length. And we're talking about something quite extreme. So this dielectric is just going to be uh, a few nanometers. Sometimes we even go down to 10 nanometer barriers over centimeters of, of trace. So it's, it's, it's a regime which uh, experimentalists are a little less familiar with because usually you don't have that small a gap. Uh, we talk about hundreds of nanometers of dielectric. That's a more comfortable regime. Uh, and, and we need this because we want a very large capacitance. Uh, and and that, that's what's going to give us uh, the, the, the interesting uh, uh, 50 ohm response of the, uh, of the device. Now there's another bonus to this is that we get a very, very slow phase velocity. It's shockingly slow uh, in the sense that uh, the phase velocity is 1 over the square root of the multiplication of L and C just like a resonant term, with per unit length it becomes a velocity. And here we have something which is 
300 or even more times slower than the speed of light. That's a huge effective index of refraction. It's not a group velocity, it's actual phase velocity. And, and that's, that's an interesting uh, behavior. And now going to the nonlinear wave equations, this is kind of standard uh, envelope equations with the nonlinearity added perturbatively. You make assumptions of, uh, of the usual undepleted strong pump. You, talk, uh, you define the phase matching uh, uh, mismatch. Uh, and uh, the parameters of the, of the uh, you know, this sort of nonlinear, nonlinearity scaling function. And uh, here it's a four-wave mixing process and you get this, uh, these are just classical amplitudes which of course transition into uh, operators uh, with the standard notation. So, and you see here, these are the, the usual parametric uh, processes with the pump again, as a classical amplitude and, and these idler and signal as quantum operators. And the fabrication is relatively simple. You start out with uh, silicon, you grow this. Here we're working with amor amorphous uh, uh, tungsten silicide. So this is a sputter target that you order with the proper stoichiometry and you sputter it after optimizing the conditions. And the nice thing about adding this uh, aluminum layer here, we add the ground on top. So it caps and protects everything. And it also allows you to have really good launchers because one of the things you, you realize with these uh, materials is that they're, they're kind of thin and nasty. And, and again, the experimentalists are nodding because they know what I'm talking about. And, and having this nice aluminum uh, tungsten sort of interface and launching into that and then going into the material is, is, is pleasant. Um, and, and we do this uh, one tone, how much time do I have? Where are we standing? Okay, that's great. That's, that's where we want to be. So we, we do a one-tone experiment and we see immediately that we have serious dielectric issues here. And that's going to plague us and that's something that will remain till the end. That, uh, that the transmission actually uh, becomes pretty smooth, relatively smooth. This is after uh, we, we impedance match everything. So this is, you know, there's some rippling, but it's not, uh, it's not horrible, indicating that centimeters of, uh, of, of this uh, wrapped uh, transmission line on a, on a six millimeter chip are pretty close to 50 ohms. But you see that at low power, there's significant absorption. And that's coming from the uh, amorphous silicon that we uh, uh, deposit. So amorphous silicon is a pretty good dielectric, but uh, it absorbs and it's TLSs in the dielectric, and again, we're looking for better dielectrics. Um, and, and the critical current of the, of the wire is, you know, in the few tens of microamps, that's a nice place to be if you want it to be an, a weakly nonlinear system. And, uh, and we get a huge linear phase going through this device because of the slow phase velocity, and, uh, and, and a significant nonlinear phase which accumulates because of the pump. And this is sort of a, you know, a conclusion slide in the sense that we see that it, it amplifies you know, on order of 20 something dB. And, and it, it, it's a pretty good amplifier even with the loss. So it overcomes the loss, which is a trivial, uninteresting TLS loss. It overcomes that part, partially because the pump is sitting right there in the middle, has a huge power broadening and it's saturating these TLSs. So we can talk about the heating effects that causes, but. Uh, as, as a linear amplifier, this behaves quite nicely, and, and, uh, and we end up with uh, very respectable and, and broadband and relatively smooth gain of this uh, amplifier. Uh, it has a, has a nice dynamic range, and if you think about how many uh, uh, photons you're sending through, so here we're scanning something like uh, uh, 50 uh, dB from, from you know, the single photon in the wire at, a, at any given time out to many photons and it, and it responds quite linearly. Uh, and, and here, using a signal to noise uh, backtracking technique, we can estimate the noise temperature and because of the standard uncertainties in, of a few dB in the, in the amplification chain, we, we have a relatively large uncertainty in the effective noise and we, we didn't go beyond that with like single photon source measurements of, of the noise, but, but it's a respectable uh, low temperature amplifier with just a few, uh, few photon or even close to, to single photon noise added in a relatively large bandwidth. 
And, and I mentioned dielectric loss. I'm, I'm going to jump over this. And, and this, we sort of optimized for it. Uh, you know, it's in terms, you, you have like a trade off of length versus nonlinearity, and, and it all adds up. And then you want to be here. So we thought about loss, characterized it, and, and, and optimized accordingly. But, but let's go multi mode. And this is when we uh, approached Joachim and started asking, what can we do together? Uh, in terms of uh, you know, more complex structures, because this is a platform. It's a photonics platform. Let, let's just put the numbers out there. The wavelength is 200. Uh, in the extreme case, the wavelength is 200 uh, microns at 5 gigahertz. That's, that's short. You can put a lot of those inside a, a, a usual chip. So let, let's do that. So, uh, so uh, wait, I skipped over something, I think. Well, maybe not. So here, for example, are, are these sort of devices. We have a bunch of ports going in. And I'm going to be talking about two kinds of uh, traces. Because what, what we want to do is we want to have a, a basically a linear trace with a very slow phase velocity and short wavelength going through. So these are like the, the broader green uh, curves here. And then we want to add these, we call them inductive couplers. So it's, it's not a super inductance, but it's a large inductance, very impedance matched, coupling between these 50 ohm traces. So we're going to call these couplers, and those we're going to call waveguides. So it's just a name. In the end, it's the same material, same fabrication, just you, you, you cut it down here to a, to a few hundred nanometers, and here it's, say, three microns. So there's, a, there's a, that difference, both in capacitance and in inductance, make these, uh, say, um, you know, just a, an appropriate uh, mismatch. So the, the, the main flow is along the waveguides, and there's these periodic couplings wherever we want to put them along the trace. And let, let, we're going to be talking about three uh, sort of devices we made with this sort of strategy. So the simplest one is uh, just a, let's call it a hybrid coupler or a two-rail system in which you have uh, two input ports and two output ports and, and coupling periodically placed along the trace. And then we went to something more complex with seven uh, uh, coupled arrays. And we couldn't resist, and we made something also resonant as well, something with uh, a resonant uh, mode. So here, uh, this actually, if you tilt it and, and distort, is actually a square lattice. You have to think about it for a bit, what's going on. But in the end, if you look how many neighbors does each one have, it, it, that's a square lattice. Um, sorry. So, so I'm, I'm going to rush through the results. It's, it's in our paper uh, from, from, a few, like a, from a while ago in New Journal of Physics. So here is the, the coupled waveguides. And when you look at it with low power, so again, just as a linear element, so it's a remarkably compact uh, hybrid. You know, if you, go, if you guys know the microwave element called a hybrid, it's, it's this. And uh, so it, it's, you couple in, and, and there was really a beautiful description that the, that the Ulm uh, uh, guys, Mion, uh, and, and all of them put together of, of symmetric and anti-symmetric modes uh, and, and the dispersion relation of this multi-mode structure to describe how the waves propagate, and it just works. You know, you really, you measure the transmission. Uh, so the ones uh, without the prime are the inputs. The primed uh, ones are the outputs. So, you know, you, you measure what goes from one to one prime, and you calculate it. And even the subtle, uh, uh, you know, everything here, uh, it, it all matches really very, very nicely. And if you go to higher power, you start to see, uh, yeah. Is that, is that power or amplitude on the y axis? Um, it's a transmission amplitude. Uh, here, here it's actual. Oh, I, I should check that. That seems a lot. Yeah. I'm going to check that. I'm going to check that. That's an extreme number here. Yeah, I should check that. That's a little weird. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to you on that. OK. So uh, if you go to higher power and, and you start saturating, actually, the interesting thing is you saturate the, uh, the couplers. Whereas in photonics, they usually saturate on-site interaction. Here, we're saturating the couplers. So it's, it's an interesting nonlinearity, and theoretically. Uh, just looking at the seven coupled waveguides, we see um, more complicated uh, uh, transmission patterns. Again, you say injecting in uh, four and looking, injecting in four and looking what comes out, and then looking at uh, 
you know, all, all the related traces, we see these oscillations which, um, you know, initially uh, you want to understand what they are, but if you, uh, let, let's just uh, skip ahead. So this is just a, a coherent walk system, which the photonics guys have, have done years ago, but now we have it also in microwaves. So you inject here and actually this is what's happening along the position, a few millimeters, and it's, it's doing these coherent uh, back and forth. Of course, nothing quantum here yet. Uh, but if you start pushing the power and checking exactly what's going on, you see that because the couplers are small structures, we have a uh, significant uh, nonlinearity even at the level of few tens or maybe a hundred photons. So we, we can push on that a little and go down to potential single photon uh, levels with, uh, I guess, less pain than the photonics people, than the optics. Um, and, and then looking at the lattice, uh, of this square lattice, we can really see, so I, I get confused. I guess this is the data and that's the simulation. And again, just no fit parameters. We, we calibrate the, the behavior of the traces and then just simulate it from a, um, uh, uh, just a simple tight binding model and, and it really works. And it's, it's very nice to see that you can get this complicated structure. Uh, and each one of these resonances has a duffing-like response, which is uh, uh, nonlinear. I'm, I'm going to skip over this propagation movie. It's a nice simulation of how the multimode uh, uh, states evolve and walk inside this lattice. But uh, uh, I want to show you something. Oop, I didn't want to do that. So th this is work in progress. I promised I'd show you some new stuff. So this is unpublished and we're inspired by uh, work that was done, of course, in traveling wave parametric amplifiers and published recently, uh, but also uh, things with uh, kinetic inductance and in general uh, parametric amplification and uh, Casimir effects also uh, from, uh, from Chalmers and even uh, going back to uh, say uh, older history stuff is measurements uh, uh, by the Wallaf group of uh, quadratures. So the project is to do broadband itinerant uh, two-mode squeezing. So that's the bottom line. And uh, just reminding everyone that we have these sort of quadratures, the I and Q, which are you know, the combination of creation annihilation operators in the single mode representation. And, and there's just standard uncertainty relations because it's an electric field. And, uh, and you have a resonant parametric amplifier. That's what I showed you earlier. And you can operate it at a degenerate mode where you look at, say, half the frequency, or you can look at off resonant with signal idlers. This is what I showed you earlier. And actually, from the quantum sense, they should be squeezed. And I'm two minutes away. Okay. So three mode mixing is actually uh, a, more, uh, a better way to work because you have less background. So you, you push the pump, you have to add a DC bias, but it works. And uh, for example, classically characterizing this amplifier, we get almost 60 dB of contrast between the stretched and the squeezed mode. And that's kind of a world record uh, for these things. And if you start looking at single mode and measure the I and Q of an ensemble, then you, you see this nice squeezing. And this, of course, is measured through a hemp amplifier chain. So it's convoluted with noise. But you see that like the blue stretched one is not significantly expanded. Actually, it shouldn't be much narrow because there's the hemp uh, width. So it should be very slightly narrower, just a few percent. So that's all the hard work of measuring a lot of data and very carefully fitting everything in order to check if it's really squeezed. So um, in order to measure these wideband correlations, we, we, there's a nice trick because it's exactly half the frequency. You can use these nice room temperature frequency dividers. This is for the experimentalists. And then you can just, with one IQ mixer, you can measure a few hundred megahertz of bandwidth of squeezing just by doing Fourier transform on the heterodyne signal. So you don't have to measure just one or two. Now, of course, if you want to go broader, you need a, a a faster acquisition card, but at, at one giga sample, you can, you can see a, a nice uh, bandwidth of squeezing and simultaneously over many modes. Uh, and this is the raw data. You know, so here, it's, well, it's clipped. And this is the I plus and the I minus. And plus and minus are just signal and idler. 
you know, uh, the plus frequency and the minus frequency around half the pump. And so each mode is just thermal noise, but uh, the correlations are strong. And in order to see this sort of squeezing, the Hemp amplifier adds about 30 photons of noise. So it's a huge amount of squeezing. To see it on a 30 photon smearing means that there's a lot of squeezing going on here. And uh, so uh, again, because time is running out, you have to really carefully calibrate everything. You have to check. You've overcome all the biases. There's IQ asymmetries, absorption asymmetries, phase noise, all kinds of drifts. And uh, again, there's, uh, there's a, a nice quote Andreas uh, posted that if theorists want to sound smart and impress their experimentalist friends, they should ask them, have you calibrated your IQ mixers? And, and the answer is always not enough. Uh, even if it's a commercial system with automatic calibrations, we're never happy. There's always more to do there. Um, okay, there's beautiful tests of, uh, for Gaussian states, uh, the, the Simon's theory of uh, uh, pa uh, partially transposed uh, uh, modes. And just to get to the bottom line, we see uh, even with very, very conservative error bars, including all systematics and having tested this for months and, and thermal scans, uh, we're convinced we see a very large multi-mode, two-mode squeeze state uh, with uh, at least seven or eight dB of squeezing, and actually it's much more, but we're limited, we're, we're being conservative in that statement. And this is sort of like a correlation matrix. So again, skipping to the end, um, uh, it's, it's a platform for microwave sources, couplers, and interactions. It's an exciting time for microwave photonics and integration with single photon sources is definitely interesting. Uh, it, it, it might open up again options for interesting hybrid systems because of its small dimensions. The capacitance can be more effective. Inductance, uh, again, there, there are interesting trade-offs. You can think of it as sort of like an impedance transform to couple to atomic systems better than before. Uh, and the open issues are, again, these dielectrics, what's going on with quasi-particles and heating in these systems, higher order harmonics, non-local effects. There's a lot to talk about and uh, a lot more to do. And thank you for your attention. Sorry for stealing some of the coffee time. Thank you, Nadav. We have no time for questions. Johan? Uh, great. Yeah, thanks. This is very interesting. <laughs> um, how do, you, <laughs> yeah. How do you know that it's the dielectric loss? Have you checked uh, that's limiting you? Have, I mean, I think it's very likely true, but have you checked the Q factor of resonators without yeah. the ground so, plane? So uh, I, because the time was short, we, we have a paper in which we just measured coplanar uh, resonance structures, and we saw Qs of hundred thousands there. Oh, and and that, that is easily limited by surface preparation sure. of our silicon and uh, some residual sure. stuff there. And it, th this was like with the dumbest process po possible. You know, you do a wet etch and you yep. still get a Q of 300,000. High power or low, or low power. Low Single low photon power. level Qs, uh, intrinsic Qs of 300,000, 150,000. Know, okay. Depends on the, on the frequency. We, we made a really long resonator, so we were able to measure multimode starting from uh, uh, 170 uh, megahertz all the way out to five gigahertz. So we got a whole uh, slew of these to measure uh, uh, their Q factor. Uh, and, and, that, that was, and, and that convinced us that the material is intrinsically pretty good. And, and it was completely comparable with the, the same aluminum process. We made the same chip with the same physical design of aluminum and it had sure. a you know, with different frequencies because of yep. less kinetic no kinetic inductance in the aluminum, but uh, uh, the losses were about the same at the same frequency. So again, it, it's, it's, uh, the material itself is pretty good. Thanks. I think we have a question in the chat. Yeah. You want to repeat it? So from Thomas Ramos, the question is, in the setup with coupled microwave waveguides, what are the possibilities to couple single photon nonlinearities like two level systems? Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, the, the uh, two level systems, you know, fabricated two level systems like uh, qubits are a natural sort of uh, implementation to couple into them. 
but maybe atomic systems, you'd have to, we'd still need some sort of resonant enhancement. Uh, uh, just running through the numbers, it's still not enough to, to, to reach the limit in which uh, photons travel through and you get enough of a field from a single photon to talk to a, a two-level system uh, uh, at that level. But with a resonant enhancement, we think we can do very nice atomic uh, system couplings. We have some preliminary work with, uh, uh, with actually with uh, all kinds of uh, deposition of cold gases, uh, cold crystals growing on the uh, substrate, trying to couple them to these waveguides. But uh, nothing to show yet, but the numbers are, are sort of interesting and different from what's been tried before, as far as I know. Yeah, Manuel. Hi. Well, at some point you said that in the photonic devices you could reach the quantum limit. I understand well, but you can reach the quantum limit even with those the electric losses. Yeah, so th that, that's a very important point. You're, you're saying, wait, you're losing all this stuff. How can you still be quantum squeezed, uh, et cetera? And that, that's interesting because these are Gaussian states and mm, uh, things are being created along the propagation. And uh, Gaussian states are more robust to loss. And along with the fact that, that the, the states are not being created at the beginning, but also at the end of the waveguide, you, you can get enough squeezing for it to work. So you can run through, and actually we'd appreciate some theoretical support on these uh, calculations of both multimode and lossy uh, nonlinearities, et cetera, to, to try and estimate what's the limit of squeezing we can achieve there. So it, it, the experiments were sort of drove us to a low frequency regime where the losses are, are, are less impressive. And, and we think that's ultimately what limits our squeezing. You know, if you, if, you, if you had the classical squeezing of 60 dB, 60 dB relative squeezing between the, the quadratures, you should get that much quantum mechanically if it's quantum limited on order of. Uh, so the losses are bringing it down significantly, but uh, the, hopefully we can, we can push on that and better dielectrics are always something useful. Okay. Thank you very much for the very nice talk and for the uh, question okay. session. Um, yeah, so thanks again. Uh, I think it's now. <laughs> I think it's now time for coffee break. Yeah, and we sorry. should <laughs> come back at? 30 minutes, so we come back at uh, 55, 10. Okay, see you. So, uh, 10, 15.